Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Mandeep Workbaker. I am the founder and CEO of National Origin Alliance. And it is my great pleasure to welcome you to the fifth and final week of the National Origin Recognition Month program. Uh, and as we begin today's program, I'm thrilled to share a great update. The Maryland General Assembly uh, has been very supportive of this initiative. And we just received a proclamation from the governor and lieutenant governor this morning. Uh, and I'll go ahead and do a quick screen share so you can see that. Um, and then um, as we begin today's program, it is, you know, we are, we are, we are truly honored and greatly appreciate so, so many of our stakeholders at county, local, and then at state level uh, that have been so supportive of this timely and highly important initiative that we need to all work together to create that society and that workplace where everyone, regardless of their uh, national origin, um, is accepted and cherished. Um, so with that note, it is my great honor uh, to welcome today's featured speakers, um, Mike Mitchell and Danielle duran Barron. And I will go ahead and, and introduce Mike. Uh, he is the CEO of Foreign Born in Information and Referral Network, uh, which serves immigrants, refugees, and asylees with legal, social, and language services to accelerate their welcome and social and economic integration in our communities. Uh, prior to his work with Fern, uh, Mark, uh, Mike had refugee, he, he worked with the refugee resettlement at two national organizations, and he had provided his ex, uh, expert um, uh, skills to various nonprofits in Maryland. And he had also an experience working with the federal government where he served on the staff of Vice President Doerr. So with, without further ado, please join me in welcoming uh, Mike Mitchell. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, everybody. It's great to be here, and I'm, I'm really excited to be with my colleague as well. Um, so I look forward to doing this presentation and understand uh, one of your colleagues is going to introduce my colleague. Um, and uh, Danielle is the staff vice president of marketing and communications at the School Nutrition Association, SNA where she oversees the Marketing and Communications Center, developing and implementing the marketing and communication strategy to promote, enhance, and protect the SNA brand. SNA is recognized as the authority on school nutrition, representing more than 55,000 members who provide high quality, low cost meals to students across the country. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Andreas. Thanks everybody for being here. I am super excited to chat a little bit and, um, you know, talk about Fern and, and the work that Mike and his wonderful team um, have been doing for the past 12 months. Excellent. So I will go ahead and um, open up the um, uh, screen share so that you all can see. Um, bear with me just a moment. Um, so, uh, for um, so again, so pleased to uh, be with all of you today. Um, bear with me just a moment while I start my share. Um, so today we're going to talk about changing the narrative. And um, as somebody who's been engaged in immigrant and refugee work for the past 10 years, one of the things that I've witnessed is uh, the great work that organizations like the National Origin Alliance uh, are doing and organizations like FERN. And one of the things that we've been thinking about is not only how do we provide direct service, but how do we change the narrative so more Americans can not only empathize, but join in the effort. At FERN, we believe that the immigrant story is the American story. It's rooted in the idea that all Americans bring richness to, and value to American life. Um, this story is best told by those who live it, and that includes many of you. But today, we're going to start off with uh, Danielle, who's going to share a little bit of her own story. Yeah, thank you. I promise I won't bore you too much with the details. Um, so I am born and raised in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, the wonderful city. Um, and um, middle class, you know, uh, oldest daughter of a middle class family. But I always had that itch that I, I felt that, you know, the world was too big and I wanted to get out. And there was no specific reason. Um, I just wanted to see the world. And, and my dad always blamed my grandparents for that because um, he said that we had this immigrant bug in our blood and, you know, my grandparents were 
um, from Spain. So um, I um, came to the United States at 18 on a scholarship. It was a uh, Department of Defense and I went to Lynchburg, Virginia um, and that couldn't have been farther away from my reality, not only geographically, but you know, I am, um, you know, I'm a city girl and I was shipped to um, a very conservative um, town in, in central Virginia. But I wanted to take a step back and, um, you know, I know I mentioned my grandparents and when Mike asked me to, to talk about my story, um, I realized that it wasn't really my story. I mean, my story started way before me. Um, and if I could um, see the next slide, Mike, that would be great. Um, so um, our, our family comes from Spain, actually, uh, Northwest Spain. Um, my, the picture was taken in 2017. And that's something that we really wanted to do. Um, all of us have been to Spain, all my family, um, except for the kids, um, have been to Spain before. We love Spain, um, speak Spanish, but we had never gone back to where um, my grandparents had left from. Um, and that's something that we knew that we wouldn't have you know, a, a whole lot of time because my, you know, my parents are getting older. So the picture that you see there is the port of Vigo. Uh, it's the um, small town back then um, where they um, saw Spain for the last time for a very, very long time. They boarded separately. Um, my grandfather was 13 and his older cousin was um, somewhat successful in Brazil and had sent for him. And my grandmother left with a local physician and his family um, as a, a nanny. So I was thinking about this and we was talking to Mindy before our conversation. We're talking about unaccompanied minors now, right? And what it is, um, and they're coming, uh, especially from Central America. That's where my grandparents were. Um, so he left um, in search of a dream. You know, things were dire in Spain back then, uh, in the beginning of the last century. And she left, I think, at this day and age, should be called an au pair, um, you know, to take care of somebody else's kids. Um, so, um, and, and to, you know, make a better life for them and, 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 and for the future generations. Um, so in three generations, we've been, you know, in three different continents. Um, and I don't think that's so unusual when we think about our own family history. So um, I thought we all get a bit of a laugh uh, with the next slide. I, um, I had asked my mom to send me some pictures when I was little and that's the best you could find. Um, so the, you know, my grandparents um, on the left, um, the Spaniards and uh, my dad is the little one in the middle. Um, then that's my dad with his own family, um, cir circa 1986, hence my beautiful outfit. Um, and then the picture on the right is more recent. Uh, it's New Year's Eve, about a year and some ago. It's actually the last time uh, my husband and our two boys went to Rio um, since the pandemic. So it was just, you know, it was, it was very touching for me to, to put these um, pictures together and, and see how, how far um, our family has traveled. Um, a little bit about me, because I think um, part of changing the narrative um, that we so much talk about at Fern is um, we're not all that different, right? Um, I am an immigrant and I, you know, I believe a lot of us are here. Um, I hold three citizenships and, and I'm very comfortable in the three cultures, which also means I'm not 100% um, in any of them. I'm, I'm a little bit of everything. I'm always, always like the odd duck everywhere I go. Um, mother of two boys that started out, I came to the US on the scholarship, got my degree in communications and international relations, then I got my master's in journalism. Um, my career here in this country has been mostly um, in the nonprofit um, industry, uh, both professionally and as a volunteer. I came to Fern about a year ago, uh, was very intrigued about the mission of the organization. Um, I, uh, Mike and I kind of came around the same time and I couldn't be luckier because in Fern couldn't be luckier. We have an amazing executive director who will stop at nothing to um, really live our mission and serve our clients. Um, love writing, I love people, I love community engagement um, all over social media. So, um, you know, any opportunity that I have to connect with people and, and hear their stories and, and share my story, um, I'm, I'm on it. So that's just a little bit about me and I think Mike has more to say about Fern and um, all of our clients. Thanks, Danielle. Um... So here is um, just a typical person that we might serve at Fern. So Danielle mentioned unaccompanied minors. Um, here is a story about somebody named Sam, Samuel. Uh, Samuel's from Liberia, fled civil war, 
um, when, and ended up in the US, lost his wife and daughter during the war. So he's got his two sons. Um, in 2003, he came to us and he applied for a green card um, because we offer immigration legal services. And while waiting through the process, um, we were able to support his uh, immediate and basic needs. Uh, in the end, what Fern wants to do is to basically make sure that we help people get agency. And by agency, we mean help them be American citizens. So what does it mean to live the American dream? I thought it would be good to share a little history about what, what is that? And, and um, so the, the term was officially coined in 1931. Um, and it's just something to think about because it's often spoken of native by native born Americans and the whole relevance to a lot of the immigrants coming to the United States today, it's sometimes lost that their, their own journey, uh, the journey of today is not much different than the journey of many persons ancestors here. Um, and here's a little look at the, the history of what the American dream was defined, um, going back to the 17th century uh, all the way to today. Um, and uh, for some his historical context. Um, so what, uh, tell us, so here is, is just some uh, statistics on immigrants today. And Danielle's gonna talk a little bit about that uh, right now. Yeah. Yeah, I, I threw the that slide in there and those stats that I that I found while doing some research. And I had mentioned to you, Mandeep, that there's so much misconception out there, right? Um, so we talk about immigrants, and and today uh, the number of Asians um, is higher than the Hispanics, right? And then when we talk about countries, um, we see Mexico, China, India, Philippines, and El Salvador. And when you stop to look and and think, you know, what is driving these people to the United States? I think that the dream is a big one, but they have so, so many different reasons. And then I think you're gonna like this very um, last gra graph very much, Mundi, because this is, although we hear the bad stories in the news, and especially this week's been horrible uh, for the Asian community. And, you know, we stand in solidarity because, you know, we are you. Um, most Americans are not like that. I mean, you know, I am married to a US born, you know, American citizen, um, and he's never been like this. We encounter some people like that, but I, I have to say after being here for quite a while, um, it is the, you know, and, and having a, a background in journalism, what you see is, you know, the, you don't see the, the dog bite the man story make the headlines, right? Um, is always men bites dogs. So we're gonna see this and 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 especially after the last four years, it's been very difficult for those of us immigrants to have this constant um, messaging, like you're not welcome here, you don't belong here, go back to where you come from. Uh, but um, a lot of American born people don't feel as like that. And I think it's important for us to, to be reminded of that too. We have each other, but we have a lot of allies out there. Um, and this, you know, and they see us as um, strength. I thought this graphic was interesting because it's, uh, you know, I'm talking about the Latin American experience because that's the one that, you know, I'm more familiar with. But if, you know, every country there in Latin America um, was, a, you know, a, a state in the US, that's where most of our people are. And it got me laughing because it's true. Uh, the, the highest concentration of Brazilians is in Massachusetts in the Boston area. But if we all had our way, myself included, would all be in Florida for the weather, maybe California. But you know, I, I just it, I just find it interesting there too. And then, um, especially among the Hispanic community, the Latinx community, um, the graph on the right, um, and that's one thing that I always and, and talking to my children, you know, that I and, that I always emphasize, right? The first generation, of course, you know, we we uh, identify ourselves as Latinx, Hispanic, Latino, and that's a whole other conversation that we're not going to get into here. Um, but the second generation drops a bit. And by the time you're fourth or higher generation, it's 50-50. Um, a lot of them don't uh, rec um, recognize themselves in the, in the Latino narrative anymore, like, you know, um, one in every two. And, and why is that, right? Is that the culture that's getting lost? Is that now I'm, I'm more like everybody else? But I think it is important that, you know, that we, that we keep our culture and, and our um, heritage alive. So that's what I thought I was, I was going to add those graphics because it was something that, you know, took me a little bit by surprise. And, and here you can see, uh, Danielle, you want to talk about some of the, uh, the growth? Oh, yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. So I have one more and, and see how the, you know, the immigration, the flow has changed, right? In the 90s, uh, where, you know, people were leaving their countries. And, and I particularly remember the 90s um, in Brazil because of violence. Um, a lot of the middle class was fleeing violence and, you know, kidnapping. And then how that has changed. And of course, now in the 2010-17s, we see Venezuela and we see what's happening in Venezuela. So I thought it was uh, very um, revealing. Um, and also on the right, you see um, in the decades too, um, where people were leaving from. So it was huge in the 90s in Latin America, but over the last um, decades, that has changed. And, and that's not what we see in the media, right? Because if, you, if, if you're listening to the media, you think, you know, all these people are coming, the, you know, the flow has definitely changed. And, um, and, and, and it's not what we always hear. And so um, the reason for me to put all these um, charts there was everything that I, I, I try to share. It took me back a little bit because I was like, oh, I, I did not expect that. Um, so there's so much that we need to do, not only us here, um, foreign born, um, but I guess our um, US born allies to, to, to really you know, go beyond the surface when we're talking about immigration and, and, and really help us changing the narrative. And that's to me, that's like when we talk about, you know, the Latino population, that's what we look like, right? And we can look like anything because we are just this mosaic of, you know, people from different countries and, you know, I was talking to someone um, and they were like, well, the only thing that unifies us is the language. And I said, wait a minute, it's not, not even that because, you know, I'm, you know, my first language is Portuguese and you have a lot of the US born Latinos, the Tejanos, they do not speak Spanish. So it's, it's a very diverse um, population. And I think you see that in the Asian populations too, in the African populations too. And the more you think about the differences, um, I think the less progress we can make. I think, yeah, we, and, and um, there's a lot of research that's been happening in the Latino community saying, how do you wanna be called? Do you wanna be called Hispanic, Latino, whatever? And most people say, no, I wanna be Mexican American, I'm gonna be Cuban American, I wanna be whatever. Um, which is which is fine because you you, you want to claim that piece of culture. But when you talk to them, uh, I find it fascinating because the, the struggles I've had at work, um, the way I speak, I am uh, very loud, I'm very aggressive. Um, you know, I've been told all these things and then I talk to them uh, and they all laugh. They were like, oh my God, this is my evaluation, you know, because I am too assertive. And, and for us, um, this is it's so culture, right? Because in our culture, I will speak over you if I agree with you. I'll be loud because I'm excited because I love what you said. And if I don't like what you said, I have no problem telling you right there and then. Uh, but when you're here in a different context, that can be you know, problematic. So um, you know, I always find that um, over the last few years, that's, that's something that I've been um, working on actually, because although we all would love to believe that we'll be accepted just um, the way we are, because we're all wonderful, uh, I don't have to tell you, that's not what happens in, in real life. Um, and Daniel mentioned a, a look at other parts of the world too. Um, this, this is, uh, there are a couple of slides here to just give an, um, uh, a perspective of many of the immigrants who are coming from Africa. Um, in 1980, there were 816,000 and by 2016, it was 4.2 million. Um, and so um, it's, it's uh, in, interestingly, Fern has been helping many Liberians lately, for example, who are uh, uh, getting temporary protected status. Um, we've been seeing uh, Congolese um, and other populations as well. And we're really uh, graced on our board of directors to have people from Nigeria and Ghana uh, as well. Um, and so looking um, at the US and black immigration, um, it's just interesting to see where uh, immigrants are who are uh, from Africa or black immigrants um, and where they've, they've ended up settling around the United States um, as well. And then looking a little closer to home, um, Fern is based in Central Maryland, and this is just a look at Asian immigration. Um, the 1965 Immigration and Nationality Act actually got rid of the Chinese Exclusion Act, which was passed, I think it was in the 1880, it was either 1878 or 1888, which was the first law that actually forbid a particular ethnicity from coming to the United States. Um, but you can see in Howard County, this is in Central Maryland, 
the number of Korean, Chinese, and Indian uh, immigrants uh, in the community. Um, and then immigration more broadly, taking a step back in Maryland, um, as I mentioned, we are physically located in Howard County, though we serve clients in Montgomery County, um, Prince George's County, uh, Baltimore County, uh, Baltimore City, you can see uh, the percentage of foreign born immigrants in these different jurisdictions. Um, so what you see for Maryland actually echoes the national picture more or less pretty closely. I think the actual number is between 16 and 18 percent of all Americans. Um, so you can see that in several jurisdictions of Maryland, the percentage is, is much higher than that. Um, and then this is actually the numbers, um, not percentages, but numbers in different jurisdictions. Um, and this data is from the uh, Migration Policy Institute, which does great research and is based um, in, in Washington. Um, so um, now a couple words about FERN. And, and um, so we, uh, most nonprofits are typically seen as a broker for service. Um, but one of the key ways to change the narrative um, is that we want to move from staff always serving clients to actually volunteers serving clients. Just a few days ago, I had a conversation with a gentleman who had spent his whole career in the NSA. And his passion is basically accompanying immigrants along their pathway to learning how to navigate American society. And in doing that, we want to really create connections and let Fern be basically a catalyst by creating relationships between people and not that we are the be all and end all in terms of relationships. So the idea here is that we can change hearts and minds without being political. Um, it's become, used to be uh, that most Americans took so much pride in immigrants and Danielle rightly pointed out the statistics, but um, there is a perception that some, among some today, that they are very controversial. Um, and we believe that integrating the pride of person's ancestral history with today's stories might be a really creative way to um, change the narrative as well. Um, and this is just a look, a little deeper dive about the direction that FERN as an organization is going. We view that there are a host of supports that people can get um, at all levels and that those supports lead to agency, maybe ultimately citizenship uh, in the United States. We don't offer all of these programs directly, but we do offer some and we can refer out to other organizations. And now for just a fun way to end our slide presentation, we just thought we would share a couple um, slides of people you may not have known were immigrants. So Sergey Brin, um, if you've heard of Google, uh, it was uh, started by Sergey Brin um, and, and, and Larry Page. Sergey was actually uh, a refugee um, brought uh, to the United States by an organization I used to work for called HIAS. Um, and so Sergei, Sergei uh, um, originally is from uh, Ukraine. And Danielle, do you want to talk about um, Carlos Saldana? Yeah, yeah, actually from, from my hometown. If you've seen Rio, the movie, um, it's, it's, it's the man behind Rio and, and Ferdinand. Um, I think he's, he's brilliant. Um, his mom is actually my parents' neighbor um, now. But I think it's, you know, um, we're talking about changing the narrative. So I couldn't think of anybody who was able to um, put things together in such a more colorful, more dynamic, whimsical way that, that, that this man does. So, of course, I had to throw him in there. Yeah. Um, and many of you have heard of Jose Andres, um, who grew up in Spain. Um, he is actually, I think his restaurants are in um, I, th I think uh, in he lives in Maryland. Yeah, he lives he in Beth Bethesda. Yeah, so, um, and he's become quite famous um, for, for his food, but he's also quite famous for what he's been doing around the pandemic um, in terms of bringing food to people. Rihanna um, uh, is from Barbados. Uh, folks may not know that, but um, if you're a music fan, you've probably uh, seen or heard Rihanna. Audrey Hepburn is originally from Belgium um, and fled after World War II. Um, uh, some of you may know of Madeleine Albright. She's also a refugee um, who is from Czechoslovakia. Um, Elon Musk he can be pretty controversial, but he's no doubt done several different things between SpaceX, Tesla, and the solar company he founded. 
Um, so I think that, yes. So we are really uh, pleased to be with you today. I would just close by saying that, um, you know, I, uh, my own history is while I'm not an immigrant, interestingly, I, I, I actually grew up overseas. I was born in Beirut, Lebanon. I grew up in Afghanistan, Indonesia, and Southern Africa, um, and I've traveled around the world. And if I've seen anything, um, it's that immigrants do bring richness to American life. And, and it's not just the diversity that you see, but it's the diversity of mind. Um, different cultures bring different ways of solving problems, and that leads to an innovative society. Um, and we see that in companies, we see that in nonprofits, um, and we even see it in this presentation with Danielle's uh, you know, stories. So we're really uh, grateful to be with all of you um, and really appreciate what the National Origin Alliance is doing um, and, and how it's making a difference. Um, and we are so pleased to be with all of you today. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mike and Danielle. This was truly an amazing um, presentation. and. It's truly amazing to see that when we you know, look at the lens of our ancestors and how this country was built on immigration. So in essence, we all are immigrants, right? And we have to be very, very thankful to the Native Americans because we are on their lands, right? They could look at everybody in the United States as immigrants, right, from that perspective. Uh, and, and I couldn't agree more with you, both of you, that it's the collective, the together, changing the narrative that is so imperative in today's age and time to be able to thinking about and breaking these silos, right? Breaking those and, and then finding ways, collective ways to move the needle on diversity, equity, inclusion together. And that will be the place, that will be the place where a lot of issues will just self-correct, right? So thank you so much. We are so thrilled that you're here today. Uh, now that we have time for questions and answers, I would ask our participants to unmute, uh, share their uh, screen if they would like, um, I mean, share their, uh, camera, I'm sorry, and then go ahead and, and engage with you. I welcome all of you um, from our participants to ask questions and engage in discussion with our phenomenal speakers this afternoon. Thank you. And I'll go ahead and mute my mouth now. Thank you, everybody. Mike and Danielle, uh, it, it was very interesting to see a lot of data. And uh, I can definitely uh, understand about the, the diversity of the Hispanics, and uh, I am from Argentina, Daniel. So we have some things in common, some things we don't like to talk about, like soccer. <laughs> but uh, we love each other. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's very. Sometimes it's very hard when you say, "Yes, I'm Hispanic," or "I am a minority," and they look at you and they see your face and they well, they listen to your accent and they think I am Italian because I am Argentine, which is almost the same, right? <laughs> so, um, and you need to do a lot of explanation. But anyway, uh, doing a lot of explanation means you are educating people and making them understand that we are such a mix that they pretend to put in the same bag and not even the language is the common denominator, like Danielle said. So there is a lot of education that is going on. Each time you have a chance to explain your origins, to explain what Latin American is, and to break that stereotype, right? That, that, that uh, in the mind of many Americans is, is an artificial construct that is not what really represents who we are. So. Uh, let's change the narrative there too and try to educate more, to, to reach, to, to explain and, and to bring food and things that are us besides our way of talking with the hands. <laughs> Thank you, Daniel and Mike. Yeah, thank you, Ophelia. That, that was great. You know, Eddie, you're right. I, we love Argentina too. I love alfajores. It's my favorite dessert. <laughs> So, but we don't talk about soccer, but I have to admit, I, I let my kids wear the messy jerseys all the time. They were like, my parents are like, have you lost your mind? What's wrong with you? And I'm like, I don't know why I like him. You know, I, I know he's Argentinian and when they play, it's very hard for me to want them to win, but I kind of want it for him. Cause I think, you know, he, he deserves it and he doesn't get it with the, the team. So yeah, I'm with you, Ophelia. I'm a, I'm a huge Messi fan.
Mike, I, I have a question in, in terms of changing the narrative. What is that we can do to really make that change and, and outreach more and, and try to, I mean, we, we are not trying to change the narrative for immigrants. We need to change the narrative for the native, whatever it's called native, I mean, for the mainstream, let's say. And, and what would you suggest will be effective ways to change the narrative and make these uh, more effective in terms of, uh, yeah, uh, embracing immigration? Yeah, I think, um, uh, I, I don't think I have the magic answer, but I think that what I've seen is many times uh, advocates like ourselves tend to talk in the same room um, and we talk to people who are already our allies. And so I look to people like Danielle for expertise and advice in going a non-traditional route. And that non-traditional route is how do we um, for lack of a better word, get into the, the culture um, of, you know, quote unquote, ordinary Americans. And by that, I mean, um, how do ordinary Americans, how can we share that their experience with different people that they love, like, like sports stars, like musicians, like um, academics, um, that, that many are from overseas, they are immigrants, and that they bring a richness to American life. And in doing that, um, you know, that they see that they're no different, that there is no difference. So that's one thing. The second thing I think is through volunteering. Um, and, and the volunteering thing is very important. Um, a few years ago, I, an organization I was with, we did a mentoring program and I had a bank vice president in rural Pennsylvania who was uh, mentoring um, a young, uh, I think it was a Syrian, right? And so he realized that, you know, people from Syria weren't all, you know, terrorists right yeah, and so, so that when the when the politician from that you know rural pennsylvania place stands up and starts talking about keeping syrians out of the united states you have this bank vice president who is a white privileged male calling up the congressman and saying you know this is bull this is bull. Not all of these folks are, are and, and, and you, you know, you've got to stop saying that. We need to maximize the number of experience between uh, native born Americans uh, and, and immigrants. And I think that it's become harder, not just with COVID, but in a polarized America where people live in the suburbs um, and they all kind of live in their own spaces. And so there are fewer uh, pieces to interact. Um, when Alex de Tocqueville wrote about America and travel, traveled around America, he spoke about the uh, number of ways Americans interacted with each other. Um, and, it, you know, Bowling Alone is a book that came out about 15 years ago by a sociologist named Robert Putnam. And he talked about this idea that Americans were no longer going to the bowling leagues together, and hence there are fewer opportunities to interact. And that, I think, is a great harm, which organizations like the National Origin Alliance, like FERN, can turn around. I will just end with this story um, that I think I've shared with um, Danielle, or, or maybe it was Mandeep, but um, there is a story, uh, if you've ever seen the show Mad Men, it's about a, you know, 1950s New York City um, advertising company, and what they tried to do is figure out how to to brand different things. And there's a story that when Neil Armstrong landed on the moon, um, and stepped off of the cape, you know, that capsule and said, it's a small step for man, a giant leap for mankind. You know, obviously that language would have been different today, but um, that one of these advertising execs was shaking his head and walking out of the room and everyone in the room was so excited. So one of his colleagues said to him, why, why are you so upset? And he said, if only Neil Armstrong was holding a Coke, Right, and it's it's this idea of how do you brand, right, and how do you uh, create um, and link an experience that gives somebody great joy 
to another reality. And obviously Coke is, maybe it's not necessarily healthy, et cetera, but, but what we need to do as advocates is be thinking along the same lines is, as how are we taking advantage of opportunities to show, you know, quote unquote, native born Americans that this is, um, you know, that immigrants are not something that is foreign or, or, or negative. So I would say those three things, it's a bit of a long answer, but those are some thoughts. I love the answer, thank you. Mm -hmm. And, and I think, Mike, the, the conversations that we've been having at Fern for the last year about change of the narrative, um, we have some physicians um, on our board and university, you know, professors and all that. And, and what bothers a lot of us is this, oh, they're so needy. Oh, poor them. You know, we must help them. And so you focus on what people lack and what they don't have. And of course, if you, like to Mike's point, if you don't know them, they're like, oh, they're here to take, right? If you don't have anything, what you're gonna do, you're gonna take. Um, but, you know, it doesn't matter your level of education. You know, if you came all the way here from whatever you came from, you left. I don't care if you came from Sweden, a very rich country or from Liberia, you know, you had that bug that my grandparents had in you. You have to be resourceful. You have to be different from everybody else that stayed, for better or worse. You know, I'm not saying better, but different. And when you embark on that adventure, you know there are going to be, you know, hurdles. You know there's going to be challenges. And you up for it. You know, to your point, you know, you have a PhD and everything's peachy. Well, you worked so hard to get that PhD, you know, or in, in anything that you do. So I think that is the, the change that we want to see. And it doesn't matter you are, where you are on the spectrum because at the end of the day, everything is a spectrum. Um, you are resourceful, you are strong and you are here in search of a better life and you have something to give. So if the ordinary Americans um, can see that, they will see you in a different light. And, and for those of us, um, Ophelia, especially you and I here, because we if we share a mile sometimes, we can pass, right? And, and that's something that I learned in the US. I had no idea. Um, actually, a black friend of mine said, um, you are a person of color passing for white. And I'm like, what? Um, you know, because I'm, I'm white. Um, and she's like, you're not here. However, you are close enough that you can pass. So that, and for the mainstream is a privilege. So it's yes, a privilege it that I have as a white presenting Latina who's educated, who has struggled, but not as much as some of our other, you know, um, newly arrived immigrants have. I have my voice and I can represent them. You know, Mike and, and I'll work, you know, we're working in Howard County here. They have this group called Alianza Latina and they reached out to the Latino leaders, you know, not leaders, Latino people, period, in Maryland, in Howard County, because they wanted to see what the community was and whatever. And, you know, we were talking and it clearly became obvious uh, quickly, that the people that they're trying to reach were not the people on that call. It's in the middle of the pandemic. I'm sitting in my office on a Zoom call uh, when, you know, my brothers and sisters are out there working in grocery stores and, you know, whatever they can find jobs, they're working in kitchens. They, they are the essential workers. So it's knowing that you have privilege. And even, you know, if you if you are an essential worker, you have a job. There's always a privilege to, that you have and knowing how to use it uh, for not only for yourself, but you know, for, for everybody else, for your community. So I think it's important that, that we see ourselves as resourceful and, and, and use our voices and our spaces. So your point might, um, you know, penetrating uh, where we can to, to talk about our experiences, but bring everybody else on board. And, and, and thanks to Fern and my involvement with Fern, um, I've been, you know, lucky to have more spaces where I can talk um, and, and, and have, you know, other people heard, because I think to Mike's point too, we're all connectors, right? So maybe that's not my expertise, but I know somebody else who can really speak to that or make a difference. So I'll be the broker. Um, you want Howard County Health Department, you want this? Oh, I know somebody who can, you know, help you with that and vice versa. So again, it's, it's putting ourselves out there and, and showing them that we're resourceful. When they want some work done, um, call an immigrant, we'll do it. I agree. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. And Danielle, nice to see you again. Yeah, after our um, presentations uh, in front of uh, Peter McCondy in January, back in January, so two, more than two months already. Anyway, so uh, I just uh, wrote something in the chat box inviting Danielle and Mike to, uh, as our, our panelists for the uh, 
educational talk series that are sponsored by uh, Tower County Tower County Community Organizations Active in Disaster and also Tower County Chinese American Parent Association of Tower County Kappa. So uh, in addition to that, I, I just uh, came, another thought just came to me that uh, maybe I, I could uh, ask the chair of the County Human Rights Commission to invite you both to have a presentation about 10, 15 minutes, maybe 20, in front of the Human Rights, the entire Human Rights Commission as well. Yeah, because we do have, a, every month we do have the public uh, sessions too. So we welcome people from the public to uh, test, testify or do presentations. So yeah, I will communicate with, uh, I think he, his name is Scott Marco. You probably, some of you probably know him. Yeah, he's our new chair for the commission. And also I will include Yolanda Song Yen, who is the administrator uh, for Howard County Human Rights, Office of Human Rights and Equity. So thank you both very much. I will reach out to both of you. Yeah. Thank you. Any additional questions? We still have a few minutes um, if, if you want to ask additional questions. And as you get those ready, I have something, a, a thought that came to my mind. And especially after um, hearing your question, Ophelia, and Mike and Daniel, your elaborated response on that previous question. You know, if we think about um, the mainstream Americans that we are speaking about, right? They are not Native Americans, right? They, we all are here in this country as immigrants. So going back to the initial thread that those families, they have their grandparents or great grandparents that immigrated just like me and other people that are here as first generation immigrants, right? So there, there has to be some other factor in this notion when people are othering the recent immigrants or somebody who doesn't look like them. I'm constantly reading and looking into that sort of the psychology literature, uh, especially thinking from the employment discrimination, right? These issues that come up in the, in the, in the workplace. So it's, it's mind boggling and also really interesting to see um, that this whole sort of notion that if in the workplace people believe, especially if you're a supervisor, right? They believe that you are this other, the othering effect regardless of what you can bring, regardless of your skills, regardless your, of your expertise, your two and two may not add up to four as much to somebody who belongs in their in-group, right? The in-group and the out-group effect. So I'm just wondering what could be some of those things. And I, I think there's a lot of synergy between the things we've been discussing, uh, some of the challenges and some of this changing the narrative that we're speaking about from the social integration could also be applied in the workplace. So what are some of those things that, that Mike, perhaps you and Danielle could speak about that how we could leverage some of the work that you're doing here in, in, at the societal level, could we implement then into the workplace, right? We know that then supervisors are responsible for making sure all of their employees are successful in their, in their roles and they have the institutional support. But somehow this othering effect that we see in the, in the larger society, it does pop up in the workplace and that is a basis for the national origin discrimination to, to some extent. And I would love to hear your thoughts. And, and also Andreas might have some things to share with his expertise and in, in the law side of the things with this issue. I, I can share uh, some initial thoughts. Uh, again, this isn't a magic bullet, but um, um, some of the things related to Fern changing the narrative might be something for you to think about is how some of the most successful uh, companies in the United States have succeeded because of, not in spite of their diversity. And so companies like Google, for example, that were started by an immigrant, um, if you go to, I mean, I in my last job, I had the opportunity to uh, work with Microsoft and Microsoft has, well, actually their CEO is from India, um, Satay Nadala, um, mm -hmm. but they, they thrive on having an international workforce, an immigrant workforce. And if there was some way to change the narrative so that companies could see that they, were, they, they would gain strength by the different approaches to problem solving that they face, that that, that could be one benefit. So, so, so not, so I guess the overall what I'm saying is if there's a way to be proactive in how you approach your work with companies, not just, um, you know, it, there's certainly the legal end of if you need to defend somebody who's facing discrimination, but the other end of that is changing the narrative for 
employers to think about how they're going about solving problems. Um, one of the things that I've seen is that companies, um, there's a company that's a builder, it's a construction company, and the HR person from that company recently told me that their HR practice was, hey, we've, we've gotten a lot of good people at our company from such and such university, we'll just send people down there. And the HR recruiter was saying, no, 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 we should be going to Morgan State, we should be going to different universities to diversify the workforce. So that's that's just one idea. I think one of the softer things that could be done is um, introducing employees to more, um, uh, more uh, culture uh, that is international um, and from different people. So that's not just having a lunch or something like that. But, you know, like last night, my wife and I started watching a uh, a Netflix series. It's um, uh, it's a it's a Korean series about the uh, uh, about Italy, um, and and so you know there there are a lot of uh, uh, foreign foreign language films and TV shows on places like Netflix. So getting people to talk about things like that and view things like that helps break down barriers. So those are two thoughts. Daniel, yeah, would you I like to. I just share something on the chat because every time I'm asked to do a presentation about diversity, equity, inclusion, I go back to this report and pull the data out and they update it. They did it last year and, and this year they did something really cool uh, for Black History Month and it's focused on the Black experience. Uh, but it's just, you know, like, there you go. If you if you want to make the business case and I, I think we're, we're moving beyond the business case a little bit, which is which is great, especially with the new generations. Because, um, and I, I kind of had anecdotal um, kind of information from my nephews, um, but then I've seen some data that say that the new, new generation, Generation Z um, in their 20s, they, diversity for them, the lack of it is what they, they that surprises them, right? If, if for mm -hmm. them, diversity is a rent, it's, 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 it's rented, right? It's, it's, it's a given. So when they don't see that, it's kind of weird. And it's it's funny how kind of you can reprogram your um, your brain too. I'm doing a, a certificate with the University of Southern Florida on diversity, equity, and inclusion, and it's it's a really great program, whatever. But the funny thing was, it's sponsored by a, a local company, and whatever. And the opening plenary was three guys, and I that to to me it took everything I had not to walk out and try to convince myself you're being biased. Yeah. You know, why, why can't you just sit here? And then it was, it was a little, you know, intro, it took a little too long. And then they introduced other, you know, uh, instructors who are real, like, you know, academics, and they were talking about different things. And this thing's going to be six weeks, but I'm like, well, maybe I'm young at heart because that, that was so obvious to me and was so distracting to me that it took mm -hmm. away from the positive messaging. One was a football coach. I know nothing about football coach, but I've seen them before, um, but it took away from what they were trying to do. Um, so I think more and more we need to be aware of that. If you want the new generation to come to work for you, they will look. And then there's all this um, I, I thought was fascinating. Actually, there was something on um, on the on the internet, and I got it. I shared with my friends right after George Floyd. Every single company came out and said, "Oh, we condemn the acts of violence, and you know, Black Lives Matter, and all that stuff." And then um, and then I you go back to those same companies, you look at leadership. And he was like, no, that is just, you know, why would you say that? So it, it just doesn't look true. It's not authentic. Um, you know, I don't need to know like what everybody's doing. If you want to do something, then then show us. And, and you that's know? and your point is right on that spot and on the point. And Mike, as you said, this is a very complex issue, right? There is no magic bullet answer. But what when I take a step back and I look at, right, we have these EEOC equal opportunity employer. We have the policies. We've done a really good job advertising those in hiring, recruitment, retention. We, we have a huge gap in showing successful examples of those, right? So we have the policies. So maybe the work that we need to be doing to fix the issue isn't another policy, but implementing those policies systematically and thoughtfully, comprehensively. So we end up with a product on the other side of that equation that speaks as an example to those policies. And I see that's where the disconnect is. And I'm, that's where my interest lies to figure out how we can impact the, the business practices, the culture in these, whether it is in academia, whether it is in, in corporate world, that 
the policies are good. We all have those, but we are lacking on the examples, right? Just to the, your yeah. point, Daniel, that you just made. I think you're exactly right, Mandeep. And I think that there's not enough proactive efforts made by companies to address these issues before they actually arise because it's very common for companies to have policies that make it clear that we don't tolerate this kind of behavior. But when concerns are brought to HR, HR is quick to be very dismissive, uh, to sweep under the rug, to discourage, et cetera. And that's what leads to problems. And so, you know, depending on the size of the company, it's very difficult to make sure that everyone is on board. Uh, and then you also have the issue of, well, if the company is not, does not have 15 or more employees, you may never even be covered under federal law. And so then uh, you're looking at state laws that may or may not be strong. It may be, uh, for example, Montgomery County has much stronger laws than the rest of the counties in, in Maryland and for much of the country for that matter. And so, um, you know, there, there are definitely challenges that companies face. Um, and and, and I, sometimes I think discrimination is, um, is very very difficult to prove uh just for the for the for that reason that um you know um it, it showing motive um it's just absent direct evidence is very difficult so but I, I do think that companies need to do a better job about being proactive and addressing concerns as they're being brought to them and i think that's their downfall most of the time at least from my perspective And I think that's where allyship comes in so, you know, strongly and needed, right? Because it's just, the, you know, the, the group of us talking among ourselves and, and whatever, and, and we know, uh, but then, you know, what is it that the company should be doing and who is in leadership now? Not us, most of the time is, you know, it's is, is mostly the white man. And, and how do you, um, and, and I've found that if it's not, if it's not somebody that is really close to you, um, then it's just, it just, it becomes like a, a theoretical thing, right? Oh, it must be terrible. Uh, but, you know, and, and I, and I, and I see that because we're in, you know, I'm in a, a, you know, intercultural marriage and my husband started paying more attention because it was happening to me. And, you know, he was like, well, I, you know, I know you, how can this be happening? I mean, it's just so crazy and it's just so wrong. And then it becomes, you know, then I have to educate because again, again, we always talk about the burden being on us, right? Um, and we talk about, especially the black community, oh, educate me, how can I not be a racist? No, you can you do your work, right? There, there's books to be read. Um, and I remember when George Floyd happened, one of my best friends who, who was, um, was black and has been here for several generations, she's like, I'm so tired of people coming to me and say, what can I do? What can I do for you? You know what I did? I did a Pinterest mood board. And I put all the readings, all my resources. So all these people that, you know, weren't really close to me, it was just, were checking on me for whatever reason, I would send them over there. Cause I just didn't have the time. I, I, the day doesn't have enough hours for me to be educating all these people. So if you're genuine and your interest and your, you know, um, search for enlightenment, then go ahead, be my guest. I've gathered all these resources for you. Um, but I think, you know, it, it, it's part of, um, us being and in, in infiltrating really in the community and, and showing them that we're like them. It's, it's our friendships. And, you know, it doesn't matter. And we talk about it socially too. I don't care what you're telling me that you, you know, you're woke and you're enlightened and all that stuff. Um, I go on Facebook. I see your friends. And if your friends are all like you, I don't care if you wax and poetic. It doesn't matter to me. I, I know who you are. I know where you stand. And, and it's the same thing as a consumer. I think the younger generations are smarter than we are because they are like, oh, you know, look at this company. I, I you know, I, I, I don't want that. You know, I, I don't want to, I, I know I wouldn't blend in. I know that I wouldn't fit in. I, I will look for somewhere else. And, and the financial industry suffered because, you know, the craziness with the long hours and all that. I know young 20 something year olds that were tapped by Goldman Sachs to work there. And they were like, you know what? No, I, that's not the culture I want. So I think if there's some hope is that our young people are, are becoming wiser at a much younger age and they will see that too. Oh, that's the leadership? I better, you know, <laughs> sweep right or whatever. I better keep looking because I don't think that's, that's for me. I don't think they're gonna, you know, move fast enough for me. I don't have that time. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. And I think it's so important. And 
a lot of our uh, speakers and participants have, we have seen this recurrent theme that it is a complex issue. Allyship, unity, and inclusion is the way. It is a complex issue, but it is the, also the opportunity for all of us to work together to fix it. It's the, the burden of that doesn't lie on one group. The burden of this doesn't lie on just one minority group or all minority groups. It's, it's our equal responsibility as Americans to make sure that our workplace environments and our social structures are created in a way that provides opportunities for everyone to feel welcomed, to feel included, to be part of the solution, right? So the way I think about diversity inclusion isn't about elevating or doing something phenomenal for somebody. It is just removing those barriers so then everybody is able to contribute, right? It's, it, it's actually removing those barriers, the work that's put in to restrict, if you would, uh, from some folks to contribute meaningfully to their workplace. So thank you so much with that. We are so, so excited and happy and, and thankful for all of your support, um, support from our stakeholders that made this event possible. Um, and then as, as a token of our appreciation, we would be so glad to ship you these t-shirts. So Andreas and I were wearing those today to sort of show you how these t-shirts, they, they came out really good. Uh, so if you would just, you know, I will, by the email, if you'll send me your size and your mailing address, we'll be more than happy to send these your way. And we welcome, we welcome the opportunity to work together. This is the platform, right? Bringing the silos, separate silos together um, in, a, in an inclusive way that we, this impacts everyone, right? These discrimination issues, it impacts everyone. And we cannot address these within our silos. It's easier to stay in the silo because that's our comfort zone. But when you reach across the other silo and you see the issues in that silo are exactly the same, we have to be resourceful. We have to be thinking outside that box to say, you know, we need to create that leadership platform. We need to create that inclusive and allyship where we can all contribute to a society that is appreciative, is inclusive. It's, it, it allows for that creativity to thrive um, and to propel our country back into the um, scientific innovation um, and being the leader for human rights in, in, this, in, in the world. So thank you so much. I so appreciate it. Um, and happy National Origin Recognition Month, everyone. Thank Congratulations, you. Thank, thank you for all your work. Thank you. this thank possible. You. Thank, thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. 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 Thank you. Bye -bye.